All right, we might as well get started. Um, <clears throat> everyone's time is very valuable these days. Um, so welcome. Um, thank you for joining us today. Uh, just a note that this session is being recorded, just to let you all know. Um, so we are here uh, to talk about two new resources that have been produced by the Software Preservation Network and its Law and Policy Working Group. Um, my name is Graham Slatt. Um, I'm uh, a scholarly communications and copyright outreach librarian at the University of Toronto Libraries. Um, I'm also the coordinator of the Law and Policy Working Group, and I'll pass it over to my colleague to introduce themselves. I'm, I'm Anna Enriquez. I am the interim head of scholarly communications and copyright at the Penn State University Libraries. So today we're going to be discussing um, two new resources, as I said, that SPIN has produced. So our agenda is to discuss, first of all, where these new guides fit um, within the rest of SPIN's copyright resources and advocacy that SPIN has been engaged in over the years of its existence. Um, we'll then go into a summary of the Section 30.1 uh, and Software Users Guide, followed by a summary of the Section 108 Users Guide. Uh, we'll briefly compare um, some of the affordances and limitations of each section to, to each other. Um, and then we'll discuss some of sort of the externalities to these sections that persist in uh, perhaps being a barrier or a consideration when considering software preservation, namely contracts and TPMs. And if we're not too um, long-winded today, hopefully we'll have um, a good chunk of time uh, for Q&A. So, um, Copyright um, was identified as a key priority of the Software Preservation Network in its formation um, because copyright concerns have been uh, consistently raised um, as a barrier to the preservation of software. So SPIN has uh, worked on a number of projects related to copyright. Um, uh, a few examples of these are the work um, with the DMCA rulemaking, with the Harvard Cyberlock Clinic, which has enabled uh, preservation of DRM encumbered software in the US. Uh, another example is the fair use uh, best practices for software preservation, um, which uh, lays out how, how fair use applies to help enable each step in a typical preservation and research access workflow for software preservation. Canadian libraries are currently working on a adaptation of these best fair use best practices to the Canadian context into the very similar framework of fair dealing. And uh, last but not least, uh, SPIN um, have filed numerous amicus briefs and comments and joined uh, alongside an increasing global network of advocacy groups that are calling for expanded rights for researchers and research organizations in the digital era. And I'd urge you to explore the SPIN website where uh, much of this uh, latter category of accuracy work is um, mentioned and ho or hosted. So the two new resources we're discussing today are, as I said, the Section 108 and the Section 31 guides uh, so so for software collections. Um, you'll find them on in this Software Preservation Network community in Zenodo, and you'll also find them linked um, to uh, on the SPIN on the SPIN website. Um, so, as I said, the guides build on SPIN's previous work. Um, they were group efforts, so, and you'll find our acknowledgements at the start of each document, and thank you to all who provided input and direction. So these guides are really meant to supplement um, the other resources that SPIN has been involved in over the years, in particular the Fair Use Best Practices document. And the origin story of them is really uh, a question that came up at one of our law and policy uh, working group meetings, which was, you know, is this fair use? I'm, I'm really not sure. And the response of other members of the group was, well, wouldn't this be covered by, by 108? And so we realized that um, it might be very worthwhile if resources existed that would help preservationists identify works and activities that could be accomplished without having to go through the exercise of thinking about fair use or for dealing, or at least that could be um, considered with um, combining the two together um, and, and guides that might explain the relationship between 
um, the broader fair use or fair dealing exception and the library exceptions in each of our respective copyright acts. So um, I will now start by talking about the Canadian guide. Um, so the structure of the guide sort of somewhat neatly follows the structure of section 30.1 um, itself. Um, so my intent was to help professionals working at LAMS make sense of the provisions of 30.1, like in imagining them, you know, opening up the Copyright Act website in one window and then using the, the guide alongside it to help make sense of what they are reading in front of them. Um, some of these clauses in, in 30.1 are extremely helpful for software collections. Others are somewhat ambiguous. So the intent of the guide was to help um, iron out some of those ambiguities and maybe explain where in some cases fair dealing might come in as a partner to 30.1 and help resolve some of those. So the content of the guide, um, the, the first part of the guide rather starts with quite a, a, a a somewhat long um, examination of fair dealing and its flexibility and about how, whether uh, it applies to software pres preservation and in what ways, and in how many cases it might be helpful to think of 30.1 and fair dealing together in your rights toolkit when it comes to um, software preservation in your software collections. It then goes into a discussion of eligibility and that the 30.1 also contains a provision which might allow for some collaborative collection maintenance and management between eligible LAMs. The guide then discusses the three most relevant clauses uh, as they pertain to software preservation, and then discusses the, the key uh, limitation placed on these clauses, which is um, the commercial availability uh, of, of another version of, these, of, the given, of a given work, which in Canada has somewhat of a, a complication there that I'll get into today and in the guide. And finally, the guide goes into um, the issue of TPMs and Canada's very broad anti-circumvention regime that has been place, in place since 2012. Um, and since TPMs are present in a lot of software, um, it seemed like it would be useful to address some of the questions that might arise um, in going through 30.1 and wondering um, uh, about which categories of software these provisions might apply to and which and for which there might be another barrier to consider, namely that the software is encumbered by TPM or digital rights management technologies. So as I mentioned earlier, um, a CARL working group is currently working on adapting the code of best practice for fair use and software preservation to the Canadian fair dealing context. Um, but with the absence of such a document for the time being, um, the first part of the guide really um, frankly makes the case that fair dealing would cover many copying activities related to software preservation. And its basis for saying that, um, which it lays out, is that a number of cases before the Supreme Court of Canada have ruled on the scope of the role of intermediaries acting on behalf of users' fair dealing purposes. And these, these cases have established directly in um, the CCH case, which uh, was a case about a library, and more indirectly in other cases that intermediaries such as a library, archive, and museum under its own exceptions can rely on fair dealing or um, other users' rights to act on behalf of the research purposes of users, whether in direct response to a request or in anticipation of one. Um, and fair dealing might especially be more appropriate as it relates to supporting the research and private study of users in a more systematic way, um, sort of in a scaled up way, whereas 30.1 in practice um, might be more focused on the reproduction and preservation of individual works um, in the routine maintenance and management of a collection. And we'll discuss a bit, of, a bit uh, more about this soon. And also 30.1, um, like any other sort of narrow specific exception, is a creature of its, the time and place of its drafting. And fair dealing by design sort of allows consideration of um, a wider scope of activities sort of outside the parameters of 30.1's focus on management and maintenance. And so 30.1 was last updated in 2012, and I think it's pretty good, but fair dealing can account for, um, you know, especially as pertains to software, 
some of the technological affordances involved and the complexities involved in uh, preserving and maintaining access to cultural works in software form. So the Supreme Court in Canada has blessed us with a court decision in 2004, which was about fair dealing and user rights and their applicability to a library, which was providing remote access to works. And the case involved the great library, the Law Society of Upper Canada, faxing uh, works, in some cases, whole works, in some cases, excerpts to lawyers um, around the province. So in CCH, amongst many other things that the Supreme Court said, um, the Supreme Court established, you know, what may be called kind of an order of operations of exceptions and talked about sort of the, the relationship of library exceptions in section 30 to fair dealing in section 29. And they said that the fair dealing exception is always available. Simply put, a library can always prove that its dealings um, are fair. And then it said it is only if a library weren't able to make out that fair deal the fair dealing exception under section 29 applied to what it wanted to do, only then it would turn to 30.2, which is sort of the cousin of 30.1 um, <clears throat> in the Copyright Act, Copyright Act to prove that it qualified for under the library exception. So fair dealing is always available. Why use, so why use 30.1 for software? So as I've mentioned, 30.1 is the management and maintenance of the collection exception. It's known colloquially sometimes as the obsolete formats exception. So it allows LAMS to make copies of full works and for institutions that have the fairly conservative uh, fair dealing guidelines that have been developed and put in place across Canada, which there is no mention of software, um, relying on 3.1 might allow for sort of a separate awfulness track that you could create without considering whether your activities fit within the guidelines that you are following. So, Lots of software preservation activities fall out of the specific criteria of 30.1, but in CCH, because the LAM exceptions are meant to facilitate users' rights, um, they too should be interpreted in a large and liberal way, lest these user rights be unduly constrained. And so you'll, you'll see that put into practice a bit when I get into discussion of the specific um, clauses in, in 30.1. So really 30.1, provides a kind of lawfulness baseline for sort of these general management uh, and maintenance practices at LAMPS. While the application of fair dealing might leave more room for questions of infrastructure and scale. And hopefully these fair dealing best practices, at least in their first draft will be out before the end of this year. So, Let's get into 30.1. First of all, eligibility. 30.1 has a fairly broad eligibility requirement for LAMs, and it includes museums. And the definition of, of this eligibility criteria, the definition of a library and archive museum, tracks to the definition of a LAM in section two of the Copyright Act. And so the really, really the only limitations for eligibility for, for an organization or institution here are that the LAM cannot be a for-profit institution or be controlled and administered by a for-profit body. And its collections must be open to the public or to researchers. So a hypothetical secret library open to no one would not qualify. Um, but also, um, you know, significantly perhaps for some uh, libraries, a corporate library or archive would not, would not qualify. Um, this is just another example where fair dealing might Obviously, still qualify if you have a if you were a corporate um, library archive. Um, the next little bit before we get into the specific subsections, um, written right into the very beginning of of thirty point one, is the possibility for collaborative collection management and maintenance. So thirty point one says that eligible lands can make copies of eligible works for their own collection or for the permanent collection of other libraries. So this is potentially very useful for software and software related file dependency issues. So for example, if a LAM needs a specific version of software that they don't have that is held by another library, for example, to view a work in its collection, 
these two qualifying lambs could share access to this to a particular piece of software to enable um, one lamb to view something that is collection that it but uh, that it otherwise wouldn't be able to do. So this is great for certain types of problems in the software preservation space, a one-to-one -one sharing of, of, of a piece of software. However, the language probably wouldn't be great um, for setting up sort of a broader shared infrastructure for software collections, you know, that's possible um, because of the nature of software, possibly in some kind of network for software preservation. Um, like SPIN, so something like something like the infrastructure that SPIN is working to develop um, might be outside the scope of this particular clause in 30.1, and that might be something that would require pondering um, fair dealing, say, if a Canadian institution were to join um, with SPIN and be, make use of its infrastructure that it's building. So, A, 30.11A is sort of an eligibility um, definition for, for a category of works that are eligible to be copied under 30.1. And the first group of works are works that are rare and unpublished and which are deteriorating, damaged, or lost, or at risk of those things. So a very clear example here would be a piece of unpublished research software uh, stored on a floppy disk, you know, say from the 80s or 90s. But a, a rare and published a piece of software might also qualify. So for example, a specific version of a, of a game, say Oregon Trail stored on a CD-ROM, um, that particular work might qualify um, pending an examination of the limitation that I'll discuss later. So there's a lot of stuff that would fit here. Um, lots of historical software would fit the criteria of A. And so in B, we get um, a particular uh, set of, set of uh, parameters and a work that can qualify under B, which, is, which entitles LAMS to make a copy of our work available for the purposes of on-site consultation. And so as written, this, this kind of reads as you know, something, there's a, there's, a, there's a deteriorating book that you don't want to share um, with the public, but you can make a copy to cut down on the um, stresses on that particular volume. Um, but this can also apply just as well to optical media or other forms of storage media that degrade or suffer bit rot. And it applies to published works here. There's no requirement that it be sort of like a, an unpublished letter or something like that. It, it's, it's very broad in its applicability. So it allows for access but with a focus on preventing, impeding, or already existing uh, physical de deterioration in an item. And this in-person qualification is here in B, but it's not in A or C. So it's, I don't think that because in-person access is mentioned here, that um, other means of providing access um, are ruled out. So other ways of mediating access to software in particular, such as via sharing a file, um, not in person, um, I don't think are ruled out because in B, we get a specific mention of in-person access. And so then we move on to C, which is sort of the, the biggie. Um, sorry, I'm going too fast here. So this is a wonderful subsection for software collections. Um, and in looking in this subsection closely, um, I hadn't really noted before, before it was point out, pointed out to me um, by Ariel Katz, how much of an emphasis that this subsection places on the professional judgment of LAM staff. So the section says that works can be copied, not just that they, if they are obsolete or becoming obsolete, they can be copied if LAM staff consider works to be obsolete or becoming obsolete or that the required technology is considered by LAM staff to be unavailable or becoming unavailable. So this has very broad applicability to all kinds of historic software. Um, and if you take uh, the sort of interpretive prescription of the Supreme Court to apply to this user's right 
this this land exception as well as sort of the definition of research if you want to give these a large and liberal interpretation um, the technology word there is also very significant it can be you know an operating system a platform not just a device to play something or device to view something it can be taken to be something a bit more um, very applicable to software so if you need a particular operating system to view something um, then you would be justified via using this subsection to make a copy that might be useful and to or to create a means of access to something by making a copy of of an operating system say so if you're interpreting this very very within the dictates of that large and liberal instruction this this exception could be very powerful but all of these uh, a b and c are subject to a limitation at 30.12 it's really a market check but it's a market check that applies that has two elements um, one of which might be incomprehensible to some of the um, many many of the Americans who are on the call um, who aren't familiar with um, the cartels that have been <laughs> in charge of um, reproducing works in Canada for almost 100 years. But anyway, that's another presentation. So if you look within the definition of what commercially available means in the copyright, in section two of the Copyright Act, it has two, two bits to it. The one is, you know, as you'd expect, um, you know, that there's a, there's a copy currently available on the market that can be acquired within a reasonable time and for a reasonable price with reasonable effort. But also, there's something here at B, uh, which is about if a license is available from a collective society within a reasonable time for a reasonable price located with a reasonable effort. So this has been a big problem for 30.1 historically um, for using it to make copies of books. Because in Canada, um, we have a very powerful collective society access copyright, which offers or claims to offer a license which could probably reasonably cover making a copy of a work um, for the maintenance and management of your collection. But there is no such collective specifically for software. And software, if understood as a literary work, might well be under the remit of what access copyright claims as his repertoire. But here, the language in B here available from a collective society within a reasonable time and for a reasonable price, and maybe located with a reasonable effort, um, I don't think that would be an, in keeping with um, getting in touch with Access Copyright and trying to get them to give you a license for copying a full work of a piece of software. I don't think simply that, simply that isn't available from Access Copyright at this time. But this is also a case where partnering 30.1 with fair dealing um, is sort of revealing because also in CCH, the Supreme Court of Canada said that the availability of a license is not relevant to deciding whether a dealing has been fair. And if I were to go on and read the rest of that, it would be even more um, persuasive that here there might be a case where 30.1 is just sorting, sort of setting a general practice and porting fair dealing and peer analysis just gives um, sort of like an added piece of lawfulness when you're considering these things. So I hope that's clear to everyone. That's really um, the main software relevant clauses A, B, and C and their limitation. So quickly, because I think I'm a bit over my time, that the guide also contains a discussion of technological protection measures as they may apply to software preservation activities. Canada's um, anti-circumvention -circum regime was introduced in 2012. Um, there was no specific uh, mention of an exception being made for exceptions to this regime. So otherwise lawful copying is not currently um, explicitly exempt from the anti-circumvention regime, which is very um, stringent. Uh, uh, infringement doesn't have to be proved before uh, statutory damages can be applied for circumventing TPMs. Um, 
And so there might be some very adverse impact in software preservation activities for software that is encumbered by TPMs in Canada. There has been some case law, some pretty bad, some pretty good, and there's actually a current uh, set of cases um, that the ironically uh, named um, litigant Blacklocks working its way through the courts that might uh, allow the courts to provide some further clarity on how um, and whether the anti-circumvention regime was really meant to override um, other bits of, of the act which allow uh, lambs to engage in lawful copying for specific purposes. So I'd encourage you to read that. And that's it for me. I'll, I'll pass it over to my colleague, Anna. Thanks, Graham. So now I'm gonna run through uh, the 108 guide. And the structure is very similar to the structure of 30.1. Um, we talk about fair use at the beginning, and then we talk about who's eligible for 108 and what are the limitations on your rights under 108, the specific provisions of 108, and I have a guide in there for how to implement it at your institution, kind of what do you need to do as a library or an archives, and then there's a glossary as well. So the relationship between Section 108 and fair use, as Graham alluded to, is pretty similar to the relationship between 30.1 and fair dealing. Uh, Section 108 provides a baseline of specific users' rights for libraries and archives, and fair use is more flexible and broader. You can use either one, uh, and that's, that's quite clear, both from the text of the statute and some case law. So 108 says, nothing in this section in any way affects the right of fair use as provided by section 107. And then, <coughs> excuse me, there is a case, um, Authors Guild v. Hathi Trust, where the plaintiff, the Authors Guild, tried to say that libraries couldn't rely on fair use because they, they had 108, they should just stay within 108. And the court said, rejected that, uh, saying Section 108 has that savings clause that I just read, and therefore it does not um, foreclose libraries or archives from relying on fair use. Um, there's another thing to mention here, which is a great article by Jonathan Band from about 10 years ago called The Impact of Substantial Compliance with Copyright Exceptions on Fair Use. And what this is for is this times when Section 108 or potentially another copyright exception like 110 or 121 doesn't quite fit what you're doing. You're nearly within that section, uh, but you're not exactly within it. And what Jonathan Bam says is that when you are substantially compliant, when you're nearly compliant with a particular exception, that's going to have a positive impact on your fair use analysis, especially under the first factor, which looks at the purpose and character of your use. Uh, so basically, these are uses that Congress has blessed through the specific exceptions. And so we know that they are favored purposes. Um, and so that's something to keep in mind whenever you're using 108 or another specific exception is that even when you're not inside the exception, you know you're in territory where it's a favored purpose and, and, and fair use is gonna look favorably on your use as well. So we do mention that uh, quite a few times in the guide. All right, so who is eligible for 108? Uh, there is a big difference between 108 and 30.1, which is that 108 does not include museums. It's limited to libraries, archives and their employees acting within the scope of employment. So museums are left out. Um, it's been suggested many times that they should be added, including by the 108 study group uh, more than 15 years ago. I will note though that a museum that has a library or an archives, you know, that library or archives can certainly use 108 and also to the extent that a museum is part of a library or an archives they can probably use 108. So in addition to being a library and archives or employee thereof, you can't have a purpose of commercial advantage 
associated with the reproduction or distribution that you're doing under Section 108. You either need to be open to the public or to unaffiliated researchers in a specialized field, very similar to 30.1 requirements. And when you reproduce a work under 108, you either need to include that work's copyright notice, or if it doesn't have one, you need to include a substitute statement. 108G is a limitation on everything that you're doing at, under 108. And it says that 108 doesn't apply if the library or the archives or its employee is aware or has substantial reason to believe that it's doing concerted reproduction or related reproduction of multiple copies of the same material. For example, um, if you were to realize that you had been copying this piece of software for a bunch of people who are all in the same graduate seminar, that would trigger this 108G uh, language and you'd no, no longer be covered under 108G, uh, under 108 at all. Uh, but you could pop over and, and think about it under fair use. And I think those kinds of course related uses are often going to be fair use. All right. So once we figure out who's eligible for 108, then there are several different substantive provisions in 108. And the first one that we talk about in the guide is copying unpublished works for preservation and security, 108B. So a library or archives can make up to three copies of an unpublished work from their collection, either for preservation and security or for deposit for research use in another qualified library or archives. There is a condition on this that was added in the mid 90s, which is that if you reproduce that work in a digital format, you can't make it available in a digital format to the public outside the premises of the library or archives. So tying this in with one of the examples that Graham used for 30.1, if you had unpublished research software on a floppy disk, uh, you could copy it under 108B. The copy would be a digital copy, of course, so you'd be limited to on-premises access unless you had some way to um, put it into an analog format for, for sharing off your premises. Um, and I should say, no one would actually do that. What you would do is you would rely on fair use for, for off-premises access, you know, to the extent that it applies. All right, there's also 108C. It's kind of a, a sibling provision to 108B. Um, so this is for published works, and we talk about it as replacement copies, the replacement copy provision. So you can make up to three copies of a published work as a replacement copy. If the original is damaged, deteriorating, lost, or stolen, or if the existing format in which the work is stored has become obsolete. Hopefully this is sounding a little bit familiar, a little bit analogous to some of the 30.1 provisions. And I'll talk uh, in a minute about, about how they line up. Um, there are conditions on this. So you have to check for an unused replacement copy of the work and see if one is available at a fair price. If one is, then you can't do this copying. And then we also have that 1990s era limitation about digital formats being limited to on-premises use. So if you're working under US law, this is where we get into a copy of Oregon Trail. You've got it on a CD. If you have a deteriorating copy, there's disc rot on that CD. Um, you can go ahead and copy it under this section as long as you can't find an unused replacement copy of the work at a fair price. Another provision in 108, which doesn't really have an analog in 30.1, it's, it's analog in Canadian law, I understand is really 30.2, um, would be 108D and E. And this is for copying at the request of users. So this section lets you make a single copy of any of these things, an article or contribution to a periodical issue, uh, a small part of any other copyrighted work, or you could copy an entire work or a substantial part of a work if you've already determined that you can't get a copy of that work at a fair price. So that market check 
uh, is required if you want to be copying a substantial part or, or more. And then there are, of course, some conditions on this. So one of the requirements is that the copy needs to become the property of the requesting user. And to my recollection, this is how we got started on these guides in our working group as we were talking about copying stuff and giving it to patrons and is that fair use? And, you know, that probably is most of the time, but if you analyze it under 108, it's extremely clear exactly what you need to analyze. And, you know, if you do that market check, you can copy the whole thing. So we're talking about copies that become the property of the user where you don't have any notice as the institution that the copy would be used for a purpose other than private study, scholarship, or research. <coughs> and you need to display a copyright warning. Um, there are regulations about this. This is why there's a sort of implementation section in, in the 108 guide, because you want to be displaying these warnings in the correct way in order to be eligible for DNE. And then there's also an exception here, which is that you can't copy musical works, pictorial, graphic, or sculptural works, or motion pictures or audiovisual works, except for things dealing with the news, uh, under 108 DNE. There is an exception to that exception, which is that you can copy pictorial or graphic works that serve as adjuncts to other works. A classic example of that is you want to copy a book, and you can go ahead and copy illustrations that appear in the book. You can copy figures that appear in the book. If we take this all over to the software context, one thing that's pretty clear cut under this section would be copying either part of a Python script or all of a Python script, as long as you've uh, done your market check for 108E. So if it's not available at a reasonable price, you can copy the whole script. Uh, so anything where we're talking about um, just code, it's, it lines up very neatly with being a literary work. And software in general is considered a literary work under US law. So other programs that are maybe have more user interface than, than just a script, um, can also be covered by this provision when they have icons in them and whatnot, that would be this kind of adjunct uh, pictorial or graphic work. And you can go ahead and copy that. But when we get into something that might have music in it, there's a problem there. And when we get into audiovisual works, uh, there's a problem there as well. So you might have software that has videos in it and we don't have any of this similar language about adjuncts. Um, for, for software that contains music or videos. Um, on top of that, there's some reason to think that video games are audiovisual works. So we get into that in the glossary part of, of the 108 guide. Um, so worth, worth thinking about there for sure. A couple other provisions in 108 that don't really have an analog in, in 30.1. Um, one thing many people associate with 108 is notices on photocopiers. And the point of these notices, which are described in 108F, is to limit a library's liability for infringement by its users or patrons. So, you know, to begin with, the possibility of a library or an archives being held liable for infringement by one of its users under US law is like vanishingly small. Um, you have to almost try to be liable. So there's a great piece on the ARL blog by Brandon Butler, who's here with us today uh, and in the SPIN working group um, that talks about this. So I recommend that if you're actually worried about this. We probably shouldn't be worried about this as, as libraries and archives, but if you would like to worry even less, you could put some of these notices on your unsupervised reproducing equipment. And in the software context, you know, we don't just want to put these on scanners and photocopiers. I mean, that's that's good. There's printed materials in a lot of software collections, but you might also want to put it on a computer terminal or 
any kind of peripherals that you're having patrons use without supervision to copy software. All right. And there's one more thing in 108. So this is 108H, and it was added to 108 at the time that Congress extended the copyright term in the late 90s. So they added 20 years to copyright terms, <coughs> and they also added this language that allows uh, libraries and archives to use works in certain ways if they're in the last year, that last 20 years of their term. So that's subject to checking that the work is not subject to normal commercial exploitation and a copy cannot be obtained at a reasonable price. <clears throat> Just a moment. All right. And also you need to check that the copyright holder has not provided notice of the work being either subject to commercial exploitation or available at a reasonable price. Last I checked, um, nobody had ever provided that notice to the Copyright Office. I think we know that for sure as of like a couple of years ago, um, but you know, you could, you could always check with them, but it seems like copyright holders are not doing this. So what software might we be talking about with 108H? Um, <coughs> the stuff that's currently in the last 20 years of their terms would be works that were published at least 75 years ago in 1946 or before. Uh, that's that's basically too early for software, but we are getting really close to this provision applying to early software. Um, it would apply to unpublished works whose authors died in 1971 or earlier, definitely include software, and to unpublished works of corporate authorship, so works made for hire. Those are not going to be in the last 20 years of their term until we get to 100 years after the date they were created. So, you know, we're talking about stuff from the 1920s right now. And that's not going to include software for quite a while, which is a shame because a lot of early software from the mid 20th century is probably uh, work made for hire and probably doesn't meet the standard of publication under US law. At any rate, 108H is here. It's waiting for us to use it for software, and, um, you know, we also have fair use if, if 108H doesn't apply to the, the stuff you want to do with, with mid-century software. All right, so there is this guide to implementing Section 108 at your institution. Basically, you want to check that you meet the eligibility requirements and then stay within the parameters of whichever subsection you're relying on. You want to retain the work's copyright notice or use a substitute statement and watch out for relying on 108 if, if you learn that you're doing related or concerted reproduction. You can't do that. So you would have to think about it under fair use. There are also those additional steps uh, for 108D and E, and we I have them outlined in the in the guide. All right. So now, as promised, I'm going to do a quick comparison of the two provisions. Uh, I already mentioned 30.1 includes museums in the eligible entities. That's a clear difference. Um, language around access, 30.11b, as Graham mentioned, talks about in-person consultation. And 108 didn't have any language about that originally. Uh, in the 1990s, when Congress added that language about access, you can't provide remote access to something that's a digital copy, um, that kind of makes it clear that that access was always included in 108 B and C. And I think, you know, they don't make a whole lot of sense without access there. Um, so that's that's a comparison. <laughs> <clears throat> and then where it gets quite messy to compare is, is looking at eligibility for copying. So I'm just looking at, at 108 B and C and comparing them to 30.11 A, B, and C. And the distinction between the different sections is different under US law and under Canadian law. So um, 30.11 A talks about rare or unpublished works. 
So, you know, Graham gave the example of unpublished software on a floppy disk or, you know, commercially distributed software like Oregon Trail. They could both be reproduced potentially under 30.11a. To do the same stuff under 108, you would have to kind of split it across 108b and 108c. Um, because one applies to unpublished works and one applies to published works. And then the other thing that we that we really wanted to mention here, uh, which Graham already mentioned when he was talking, is the breadth in 30.11c. It's, it's really nice. Um, so compared with the US provision, we just have where the copy is damaged, deteriorating, lost, stolen, or obsolete. Um, and, and so it just needs to be obsolete uh, in order to uh, be copied under 108C. But 30.11C says that it could be where the library, archive, or museum considers that it's obsolete or is becoming obsolete, um, or that the technology is unavailable or becoming unavailable. And that technology part, that is part of the US um, understanding of obsolete. But the additional deference to LAMs and, and LAM workers uh, that's in the Canadian statute doesn't really have an analog under US law. All right, so one more thing, and then I'll hand it back to Graham to talk about TPMs, and then we'll take your questions. Um, Even when it looks like 108 is going to work perfectly, or you're right within the bounds of, of 30.1, there are some other issues <laughs> that can that can be a problem. And one of them is contracts or terms of use or any kind of agreement that has been made that's that's legally binding about how the software is going to be used. <laughs> so when we're talking about contracts, key questions are always going to be. Was there actually a contract made? You know, was it formed? And in the US, we have case law that's kind of all over the place on, you know, how much does one party need to actually agree with the other party in order to be bound to the contract? Is it enough to unwrap the, the shrink wrap uh, software license? Is it enough to just browse to the website that has terms of service? Um, so, that would be the first question is, is a contract actually formed? The next question, especially for cultural institutions would be, are you a party to the contract? Because somebody else may have formed a contract with the software distributor in 1985, but it wasn't necessarily your institution. So if it's not, then the contract essentially doesn't apply to you, you know, barring some obscure stuff about like you being a successor to the person who, who, was originally party to the contract. But if it's just coming to you from a donor, you're probably not a party to the contract. And then we have to look at what the contract says. And this ties into another project uh, in the law and policy work, working group uh, at SPIN that we've been working on that's, that's not published yet. But we had this idea that maybe contracts were nicer back in the day. And it seems like that was wrong. <laughs> you know, they might have been shorter but they still contain a lot of the restrictive language that we don't like to see as far as software preservation goes. Um, so you would have to look at a particular contract to, to figure out if it's a problem, if you think that there's one that's binding on your institution. And the, the extra bad news for, for the Americans on the call is that 108 explicitly says that it's leaving contractual obligations intact. So you can't say, oh, 108 allows this, Therefore, it's it's fine. Uh, you're you're kind of you're you're stuck. If if you have a contract that's binding, then 108 is not going to help you out. Uh, 30.1 does not have that language, and I will pull up the last slide for Grant now. Thank you. So another thing to consider, um, as I've already discussed, um, which forms a part of the guide, is the role that TPMs play um, in potentially um, limiting or determining um, which bits of your software collection you can um, reproduce uh, using 3.1, Section 108, but also the other exceptions in each of our country's respective copyright acts. 
And the question is still um, somewhat unclear, I think, in both jurisdictions, whether TPMs do um, override and limit um, lawful use in sections 107, 108, sections 29 and 30 um, in Canada. So in the US, um, we have something called a circuit split where we sort of have con contradictory um, case law at, at play. So it's, it's still um, hard to rely on that side of the law to, to make decisions about whether TPM applies. But if TPMs do override fair use and other exceptions, um, SPIN has worked to establish exceptions to these anti-circumvention rules for um, software collections, including most recently in 2021, where remote access rights for non-game software um, was secured during the DMCA triennial rulemaking process. Um, and when these slides are shared, there's a link there um, to a slide deck by Brandon that goes into what actually um, was won in that process and, and what some of the implications are um, for fair use and for other things. But if no, but, it, it, but we're still, we still don't know if what the implications might be if no. And similarly in Canada, um, there's sort of multiple strands of um, clarity seeking going on. Um, there's the possible outcome of uh, the black locks cases where interveners um, have participated and where, where there may be um, some instructive findings by a court about um, was it parliament's intent, uh, intent to override um, users' rights in the act with section 41. Section 41 itself um, says that it may impact other um, certain things, namely research, private study, um, and um, allows the governing council uh, the means to issue regulation to limit the scope of section 41. There has been no such regulation released um, and there is no sort of formal process for like the, the rulemaking um, for Canadians to band together and, and make a plea for, for such a limitation on the scope. And of course, there's the upcoming um, mandated review of the Copyright Act 2022-23, where there's a chance that um, sort of uh, legislation could be, could be released that might uh, limit the scope. But otherwise, um, we still don't really know um, what PPMs might do to our users' rights. And I think that's a fairly optimistic way of looking at it. Um, and, I, and I tried to strike a balance between the sort of the, the bleak view and a more optimistic view in the guide. But really, I think it's still an unknown in Canada um, what the, the scope of Section 41 is for, for LAMS and for users' rights more, more generally. And that, with that, um, it's the end of our, our slides. So if you all have any questions, feel free to post them in the chat or um, unmute or un, uh, blind yourself uh, and, and, and ask a question. We'd be happy to try to answer them. John, John Gerno. Well, hi. Um, really interesting talks. Uh, thank, thank you both. Um, I have a question around um, uh, preservation of software where the sort of provenance might have been uncertain, let's say, or um, uh, let's say you're not entirely sure how the software got into your collection. You don't necessarily have a uh, maybe it was a donation, maybe it was something that somebody downloaded from somewhere and it just sort of happened to show up in your archives. Um, does the copyright law, I mean, uh, is that covered here or what, what would be the status of that kind of software in a, in a, in a collection?
that's a great question. And I don't, you, you seem more certain of something to say than I do. So, so there is a section in one of the other specific exceptions in, in U.S. copyright law talks about in, in 1101 says that you can only use 1101 with a copy that was lawfully made or at least one that you didn't know was not lawfully made or didn't have reason to know it was not lawfully made. There's not language like that in 108 as far as I can think. Um, so, you know, Congress, U.S. copyright law sometimes makes a distinction about this and sometimes doesn't. And I, I don't think 108, um, you know, there's there's not a requirement like that in 108B or 108C that says, well, you can only preserve deteriorating works if they were lawfully made in the first place. Um, so there's that. <laughs> Uh, that, yeah. That's the 108 answer, as opposed to the like, you know, it's a big question, but as far as the 108 guide, I, I think basically it doesn't look at that issue. Yeah, similarly in, in Canadian law, there are specific educational exceptions, um, which do sort of uh, dial, dial down and say, you know, if, if you should have known or know that it's a illegitimate or unlawfully required copy, then the exception doesn't apply. But there's nothing in 30.1 or you know in the fair dealing exception or in some other users rights that, that have something similar to that um it's really the only the works available on the internet exception which is specifically um sort of an education and teaching focused uh exception where there there is a requirement there Thank you. That, that was that was uh, helpful. Yeah. So Jess has a point in the chat. It would be nice to sort of indemnify archivists. Um, we don't really have that under U.S. law, but I will just mention a provision in in the part of the Copyright Act uh, in the U.S. that talks about damages um, and and what what happens at the end of a copyright case if you are liable. Uh, that's Section five hundred four, <laughs> and Section five hundred four C two says that statutory damages shall be remitted i.e. they're not available, um, if the infringer had grounds, had reasonable grounds for believing that their use was a fair use under Section 107 and the infringer was an agent or employee of a nonprofit educational institution, library, or archives, or the library or archives or institution itself. So there's that. And Graham is saying in the chat that there's a similar uh, limited indemnification um, related to evasion of TPMs for, for LAM employees. Any other last minute Thanks questions? Well, I guess this is your, I guess we are literally out of time, but at the buzzer, there's literally never been any litigation about 108 per se that I'm aware of, uh, I think, right, Anna? And then, so Graham, has there ever been litigation in Canada about 30.1 per se? I mean, you mentioned CCH, which sort of mentions 30.1, but nobody's ever been sued and said, I'd use 30.1 and then won or lost, right? Not that I'm aware of. And, you know, similarly, similar to how um, Anna framed the Hathi Dress case, the CCH case was the case of a publisher saying, no, 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 you're limited to this specific exception. And the Supreme Court saying, yes, but also <laughs> fair dealing. 
but I'm not aware of um, a litigation that specifically um, grew out of the, you know, the in the disputed use of of thirty point one or yeah. thirty point thirty point two for that matter. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, so then, I mean, you know, maybe that's another interesting in thinking about these guides and these provisions. Like, nobody wants to sue libraries. That's the reason these things aren't litigated, and libraries are very careful. And so, you know, that's another part of living, living, you know, living as a library within the realm of copyright is we don't we don't have a lot of appetite for risk, but we're probably also not subject to a lot of risk. Um, so you know, it's a weird it's a weird place to be, but um, it's not as scary as maybe it seems at first glance. Okay, thanks guys, sorry. All right, well, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, let us, either of us know if you have any questions about the guides. Um, I, I hope this was informative and, and it's a great to see such a large turnout for, for copyright related materials. And um, I hope you all have a good week.